Welcome everybody to uh, our BCE at our final BCE at work series for uh, 2020. Uh, and this one we're, we're happy to be producing in conjunction with Imagining a Way Forward discussions on theater, uh, which we partnered with the School of the Arts the, and the Marble Institute and particularly Professor P. Carl, who you see here, as well as Professor Joanna Jukan and uh, Professor Stacy Galloway. So it's lovely, lovely when the BCE can combine um, across the college. Uh, welcome to our students and our guests listening at home. Our uh, super excited to have our special guest uh, this week, Ms. Camilla Forbes, uh, where I'm going to read her bio, or official quick little bio, real quick. Um, but uh, Camilla is an award-winning director and producer, and currently the executive producer of the world-famous Apollo Theater in Harlem. Uh, in her diverse body of work, Camille is noted for having a strong commitment to the development of creative works for and about the hip hop generation. Her talent in the range of, of the aforementioned endeavors has been said to, quote, cast a vivid and evocative spell on both the national and international stage. Uh, and we are super lucky to have Camilla talking to us because in, in addition to her wonderful work at the world famous Apollo Theater. She was tapped to be the director of the new uh, adaptation for HBO of Todd Nahasi Coates award winning book between um, the world and me. So which is coming out on Saturday debuts, right? Come on. Saturday. Yeah. We yeah, have a so, later on the tonight. It's actually in a yeah, couple hours. Super, super excited. Um, one of the most important books <laughs> of our time. So um, my brother Pete Carl is going to be leading the conversation. Tonight, I'm going to hit Camilla on the hip hop side. He's going to hit on the theater side, and then uh, and then we'll and then we'll open it up to our our students. If you have questions, uh, Kristen, who's our producer of this series, uh, and, and shout out her and Valeria, will be monitoring the chat. You can hit her privately or publicly, um, and then we can get to your questions at the end. But if I could, Camilla, to start, if you can just sort of maybe say a few words about your journey, where you are, just. How you feeling and kind of mm. stage with tonight? Yeah, I mean, the journey is kind of, um, I mean, where I am now, it's, uh, you know, I'm all stuck in my house, just like you guys. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's been really wild. I, I keep thinking of that quote, you know, who, who ever knew that hip hop would take it this far? Like, I think about that, Wes, when I see you, because I've known you through many moons. Uh, when I first met you, I was a, I had a rap group, several different rap groups. Um, I, we weren't on your level because you were running, you were like running with like the big dogs and we were just trying to get signed, kind of, I don't know what we were doing, but anyway, but I, I say that to say is that, you know, seeing how that sort of initial creative um, artistic bubble and collective really allowed and morphed and continue to morph in so many different spaces and places, whether it was into theater, whether it was into now working at the Apollo, whether it was into now with this work also with ta because that ethos of hip hop and, and hip hop culture definitely also rang true in how we adapted his book for the stage, but and then also now for film. So, um, so it's really kind of profound when I sort of sit back and think about like, you know, where I, you know, sort of what the journey has been. Um, so initially, yeah, I mean, I started, I, I, I don't want to go into too far of my journey because B. Carl, I know you probably got questions for me. <laughs> yeah, we, we all do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, so um, um, I'll stop there. Um, but I'm, but I, but I can lay some more groundwork for sure around you know, just my background as well. Um, whenever I do, if, if I, I just, I do want to point it out maybe to the students and um, to kind of give a shout out to all us quote unquote old people on here. And I tell my students all the time, you know, all the best people I know have had five different lives, um, and it all comes back together. So sometimes I forget how far like that was probably 25 years ago in the grind in DC back even when ta was just a writer was it the city paper he was covering the city paper so yeah. we were both students at Howard University I was a student a theater student um, and really you know excited by theater but really I realized I was really excited by language 
Um, and that was a real core for me for theater. So that also translated, you know, to uh, being excited by hip hop culture. Um, so that led me to um, also be very attracted to sort of spoken word collectives, very attracted to starting my own several different iterations of rap groups. And I tried to get down with Wes Jackson, had a company called Seven Heads Entertainment, and he represented a bunch of like really amazing folks. And, I, you know, I wanted to get booked like they were, um, but we weren't we weren't that good. Clearly, um, so I mean, the biggest <laughs> mistake I've ever made in my professional career because look at you now, uh, but uh, yeah, you no. should have signed me. You should have signed me. <laughs> I, should have, I should have. Listen, I'm dumb. What can I say? But I can, let me just launch into it. But I think, uh, you know, Camille, like our program is filled with people who have multiple yeah. interests, yeah. right? And they're interested in theater. They're interested in gaming and tech, and they come in like uh, sometimes apologizing, yeah. like I'm sorry, I don't know what to do, and I'm like. Yeah. Be quiet. That's the good part, that you're all over the place and, and lean into it. So I almost maybe, um, and, and maybe on the hip hop side, then we can go, go over to Carl on the theater side, but to toss it to him, how did you make that sort of pivot for your love of like hip hop culture and being like that fine arts theater person in the crew? Like, how did you manage what to some may have seemed to be conflicting energies, but obviously yeah. to you were harmonious like how did bit like rewind to the yeah. beginning how'd you square that peg you know it's interesting because it's so great you know I, I was in a laboratory which was college right so during the day I was in my theater conservatory classes and at night I was at the hip-hop clubs performing um I did a program in in Oxford England um which was the, the conservative you know classical theater program and every single night I was trying to run to London to go check out a new show and I heard that Tribe was performing and I heard you know De La was performing just touring to London so I was at every single show so it was almost a duality of life um I think that I felt like I was leading until you know there was a professor that I had and I remember this turning point and um, it was a professor I remember her so clearly Sybil Roberts and she had a program called the Playwrights Lab and in that lab it really you know it, we were learning you know I, and I and I felt it was very progressive learning about what we we were learn we were taught as a canon at Howard University, you know, predominantly African American University. The canon was Douglas Turner Ward, it was Adrian Kennedy, it was all of these black writers, which was amazing as sort of our foundation. But yet, and still, I still didn't see my generation reflected back to me. So she had a lab called the Playwrights Lab, and it was really an opportunity for us to explore our own writings, or really what really what I now know as devised theater, what I now know as multidisciplinary theater. Um, and in that lab, there were several of my colleagues who were also interested in hip hop and spoken word and theater. Um, and, and we got together and started building works together. Um, so one of the works we built was a piece called Rhyme Deferred. Um, I co-wrote with one of my um, colleagues, um, Chadwick Bozeman, who who was a, um, a classmate of mine who also starred in the piece as well. Um, and we pre presented, that was our senior thesis. We then beyond that started to, we took it to several theater festivals. Um, and that really became sort of a, an eye-opening experience that, oh, okay, this idea of hip hop and theater could possibly be possible, right? This is 20 years before Hamilton. This is like, you know, so it was very revolutionary to have this idea of turntables on stage, to have an idea of a play told in verse and rhyme um, and b-boys and breakers really be sort of the physical foundation of the physical language of the theater that's being told. Um, and then that, you know, through that experience of Rhyme Deferred, we started to meet other theater makers um, of our generation who had similar sensibilities that were creating work nationally. Some of those folks were, um, Wes, you remember Clyde Valentin, Danny Hawk. Um, yes, of course, B. Carl. <laughs> I miss yes. Clyde, I miss Clyde. Yeah. Clyde's in Dallas, Texas. So I know. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we met people in London, um, Jonesy D. Um, so there were a bunch of folks who were really building in this idiom. And, and Sarah Jones was also sort of in the spoken word scene doing poetry at that time. Um, and then we came together and said, listen, well, let's, why don't we create a home for ourselves? And that became the birth of what ultimately became the Hip Hop Theater Festival, which was a festival that we started in 2000 um, to really be a home for artists that were really looking to embrace the voices of the hip hop generation in the field of theater. That's great. 
Carl, I didn't know you knew Clyde. Carl, we clearly need to spend some more time with you. Clyde, 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 you Clyde, Clyde and I have been doing sneaker wars for like 15 years. <laughs> so I just want Clyde and I are like, you know, yeah. we're like this, man. Yeah. yeah. But good, what maybe I just toss it in that vein. Maybe Carl wanted to sort of ask a question from your side. We can just maybe go back and forth. So take it away. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm just so happy to see you. It's been such a really, really long time. It's uh, it funny because I I'm in the process of moving. It's like, oh, I've got to do this thing, and I'm like, oh, but it's Camilla, you know. Like, I'm like, I had to remember what it was. I'm I'm so happy to see you. And you know, one of the things just even listening to you talk now, I mean, you have been such an incredible trailblazer. And I think about even in the theater. I mean, you 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 know, you have this multidisciplinary work. But when I think of your theater work. You have worked with the really the great uh, some of the great American playwrights, Lynn Nottage and Katori Hall and Dominique Marceau. I mean, you have been out there, uh, uh, you know, at the forefront. And you know, it's it's it. One thing I think about with that is that even you've done all that, and yet we've the the field itself. Like everybody turned to Hamilton really easily, right? Everybody, and it, not undeservedly. I'm just saying, but like. It, in my mind, that work has really gone, has been, it's been recognized, but also overlooked, right? I mean, in terms of its power, right? And in terms, you know, and so I just wonder, and then I, I, I this is a kind of a complicated question, but then I was thinking about Rada Block's 40 uh, year old version, because, you know, like, the, just trying to like bring something different to the theater and then going, I'm just going to go make myself a film, you know? And so, uh, I, I wonder just like that history for you of being at the forefront and where you feel things are sitting now, uh, given, uh, you know, your, your long, long history, making paths for other people uh, along yeah. with yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting one. I, 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 um, I, it's funny because when you talk about that, you know, I never even, sometimes I, it's, it's hard to even recognize that, Right, Dominique, Katori, Lynn, you know, working with them, those were people who were in my community. Those were my homies. So of course we worked together um, because we were of like mind, we were coming up together. So, so there was that. And then to see now kind of where the work and the body of work sits, is, it's, it's kind of incredible. But also there's something I think we think about pioneers, you know, um, as, 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 you know, to use some of that language, you know, sometimes there's a, a graffiti artist, um, um, Mayor 139, and he always, he has this quote, the pioneers are the first to see it and the last to be seen. <laughs> Right, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, and and yeah. and there's so and, and there's something, and I, and I don't say that in a in a in a slight way, um, because I think there's some some really sort of profound weight to his quote, right? In that there is something about forging a path, um, and it doesn't mean that you don't continue moving forward. It continues to mean that you continue to look forward. You continue to see what's ahead, um, because that's ultimately what's feeding and 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 purposing you. Um, um, you know, and I also think, you know, when I think also about the American theater, it is a very slow moving shift. When I think about how quickly culture moves, and particularly now that we are now in what's called the digital age, the live, the space of the live theater, and if the last nine months haven't taught us that, um, that theaters don't know what to do in this moment of COVID when people can't come together and they're so used to producing and building in one particular way, it is a very slow moving ship. And it's not just in the way that we consume work, but also what the work is that we consume. Um, and, and, and I think that's a, that's a major, major issue. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the reason why, you know, we, we have sort of systems and canons that are built on ideals that are hundreds of thousands of years old, whether we're talking about ballet or opera, and we're ultimately only upholding that ideal, but haven't taken the moment to question how relevant is that aesthetic now to the culture that is being created by the world around us, right? Um, and, and, and those systems are actually not interested in questioning that, right? So, so it just makes it a much more slow moving ship. So I think that it's, um, you know, it's emblematic of our field. Um, it's emblematic of arts and culture institutions. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that's a big issue that, that, that needs to be shifted, that needs to be challenged, that needs to be questioned um, and, 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 and shaken up.
Yeah, I, you know, I want to follow it because I think you know, the, the, the slow moving ship uh, is, uh, resonates, of course. Uh, but, you know, w one of the ways, I'll try not to make this too like my theoretical head, but one of the ways I think about and I teach uh, my students about, you know, there's the systemic parts of the, th the of institutions, right? Systemic racism, right? Systemic patriarchy, right? They're built in, right? And those things move. It's, gla it's glacial, right? It's really, really slow. In the theater, you know, I would say you you can argue with me about. It. I think we've made some progress in the arena of representation, right? So there's like the system, and then there's the playing space, right? And in the playing space, you know, you look. I mean, you look at some theater seasons over these last, you know, five, seven, eight years. They look a lot more interesting than they did a decade ago, right? Sure. Um, and so one of the things I think about is, you know, in this moment of quiet, obviously, uh, there has been a real reckoning in the culture uh, with uh, uh, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. And that reckoning has uh, obviously come to the theater as well. And it's been, uh, it's been a very uh, different kind of reckoning. And I wonder, uh, you know, if you would just sort of comment on, you know, how you've perceived that and where, like, and can this can this shift actually shift some of these systems? Because that's where I think that the target is now, right? Is the systems, not just the representation. Yeah. So, you know, I think one thing about representation and I think it's, it, and it's applicable to theater, it's also applicable to the music industry. You know, it's one thing to, and I think, yes, yes, that it, that, that strides have been made around theater seasons and how do we make sure that who's on stage is more diverse. Um, I'm very much interested, and maybe this is also the producer in me, is how we're producing and how we're and who we're also inviting to the theater. A lot of that has to do then with the how we're producing and 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 who's doing the producing, right? Um, because I think it is one step to actually change sort of the images of what's happening on the stage, but yet it's another step to change. Well, how do our who's actually who's actually in the institutions? Who are on the boards because those are very critical decisions to how we shift what is the experience like when you come to the theater who's being invited who when we say is our core audience who are we actually talking about and until i think the stakeholders of the institution have um, shifted their own ethos around that um, will there really be like significant um, um, and long-standing systemic change? And I don't say that, you know, and, and, and I don't say that it's not coming. I do think it is. Um, but I do think that, you know, given the nature of nonprofits, it takes a lot longer for that kind of change to happen. It takes a lot longer also because of this idea of canonization of art and art form for that to happen because you know we hold on to those like but no this is what we've always done and this is what we're teaching in the academy and ultimately then we would have to change that and then we you know there, there's there's a there's a lot of thinking that ultimately has to be disrupted for real shake up um, to happen so that's all to say is that not that change is not happening but we've still got a ways to go right yeah, 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 and I think you know the the piece about the systems that you're talking about, the boards and all that stuff. I was uh, teaching um, the this week teaching federal theater project, and then we're gonna teach uh, we see you white American theater, right? Two mo two moments of crisis and how w dealt with the, in the depression, and then now being dealt with in um, this pandemic, and and the federal theater project, of course, is really was this really visionary idea about regional storytelling right, right. that right. then evolved into a kind of uh how do you get to broadway uh very uh questionably nonprofit <laughs> in its private right. Life, right so so i wonder about, what i wonder about in that is the relationship as you say of the behind the scene where the capital comes from and that intersection of capitalism and entertainment and how that keeps those producing systems looking a particular way even as they're you know different maybe different representation on stage and and i just wonder like as you're at the apollo now like do you feel like that is starting that is that is that shifting enough or do you see that shifting in terms of the 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 the, the business of it as well as the um experience of it 
Um, yes, we're starting to see that shift. You know, it's really been interesting being at the Apollo because this is one institution that we, I can kind of look and track a 90 year history of arts and culture, um, integration, distribution throughout its one institution's 90 year history and, and how it's had to pivot. Um, you know, and part of what I've really, you know, and I, and I thought this a while ago, you know, like 20 years ago, and I've really been revisiting this thesis is this idea of reinvention of institution. And um, I think about it personally. I think about every 10 years, you've got a question, what am I doing? How is, well, how is this affecting the world? How is this affecting me? Um, do I need to do something completely different? How am I doing it, right? Um, I think institutions need to do the same thing, particularly culture institutions, because simply because of the fact that culture changes at such a rapid rate. Um, and, and unfortunately, the systems of institutions have built, be built and, and P. Carl, you said it, on systems of capitalism, which are, which are at times very mammoth, and not as nimble, <laughs> um, particularly the models that they have followed, right? Um, and, and, and therefore are not as easy to turn around and be as responsive as necessary as I think to be truly vibrant. And this is a conversation that we're also wrestling with in the Apollo, right? How do we be really truly vibrant and responsive to culture, to community? Well, we've got to do some things different. There's some things that yes, we've done for a very long time that is it really serving? I don't know. I don't think so, right? Um, you know, so 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 I I I I um I like to to disrupt and ask those questions on a on a consistent basis. Um, um, as I'm asking myself, as I'm asking my own institution, and and, and looking to ask other institutions as well. Yeah, hey, great. Go ahead. I'll, I'll shut up now. I'm like, you know, I could talk to Camilla all day. We had a chat sometime. I'm like, a, yeah. <laughs> anyway, go. On. No, no, it. I appreciate Carl because you actually kind of touched on what what I was also thinking, but I almost want to maybe kind of take that same energy and look at it from the the purely business administrative point of view, Camilla, like, because that was my thing it was like, how are you do managing this as you run the Apollo? Because you are creative and now you are sort of the, the, the executive at the same time. So all of this seems like it could be in your hands to move, but I'm sure it is difficult. It's not like you can just, again, not all at nimble, but what is it um, from the other side of your brain, from the running the, the theater side of it, how are you approaching this as you're also still a creative, if that makes sense? Like, what are yeah. some of the things that the Apollo has been doing that you're trying to break? What are some, maybe some new methodologies from a, yeah. from a, uh, you know, a, a operational level? So, um, you know, the Apollo has already historically been a, um, it was founded as a music hall, right? As a commercial music hall, as a commercial music venue um, in 1934 and was operated for much of its history until the early eight and uh, mid eighties as sort of as such, right? So the idea is you want to get the bigger acts because ultimately it's all about sort of the expense to profit margin that keeps the business running, right? Very sort of simple, basic cut, cut, you know, right? But along the lines also became, you know, a, a, an incredible sort of um, home to African-American artists, African-American voices, um, and, and, and nurturer of a culture, of a cultural history, American history, et cetera, right? Um, but where we are now, we became a nonprofit in 1991. And that was very purely a business decision um, because as a 1500 seat theater in New York City, and as a union house, the business model no longer worked. There were acts, the acts that came to the Apollo um, and came to a 15, that could fill a 1500 seat theater, the profit margins were so slim, you could no longer run the theater. But our leadership at the time, Mr. Percy Sutton, um, understood the historical significance of the institution um, um, and went to the state, built a nonprofit board, um, pulled a board chair together, who was Dick Parsons, um, and, and they built, landmarked the building and built a nonprofit organization um, so that huh, the theater could continue to operate, right? 
So now here we are, that was 1991. This is now however many, is that 20 something odd years? I don't know, I can't do math, 30 years, whatever, something like that. Where we are now, 2020. Um, over the last 10 years, we have really now almost reverse engineered saying now that we're a nonprofit um, um, and yes, we are a historical home, what is our mission? So we've actually come at it in a very different kind of direction. And, 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 and in, in, in some cases, I think it's a real opportunity because we're, we're one of, our, I like to say, the oldest nonprofit in America, right? Because we are a 90-year-old institution, but really only have a 10 to 15-year history as a nonprofit organization. So then it's really allowing us this opportunity to be nimble in what it is that we're responding to and what it is our mission is now and today. Um, so, so that's what's exciting to me as a leader because that's where the opportunity is, I think it gets very juicy. Um, so now where we are is that we see that when we look across the country, there is actually, you know, of an institution of our size. So we're an $18 million organization. Um, there is no African-American centered performing arts organization that's focused on multidisciplinary arts African-American organization in the country, period, full stop. So there is, therein lies our opportunity, but there also in lies our responsibility, right? So we look at sort of that landscape, right? I came to the Apollo about four years ago and I remember reading the TCG, um, uh, um, one of the TCG reports, I think one of the also reports from Todd London about um, playwrights and diversity around the country and the percentage of African American um, plays that were produced, and this was made, this was three years ago. Um, they were looking at across stages across America was four um, percent. In New York City, five. In New York City, that is a majority minority city. We were not presenting the works, or, or the works that we were putting on our stages was not reflective of the people that lived in our city full stop. So therefore, we saw ourselves as an opportunity that, okay, here we are now the only African American Performing Arts Center in the country. Um, where is our opportunity to be a home for not only these voices, but the next voices of the 21st century? Um, not just in theater, but in multidisciplinary arts. Um, we then started to look at the sort of the commissioning landscape in music where some of the major commissions, there was a commissioning study that were put out particularly around orchestral music, and it was 1.5% of, of the commissioning dollars orchestral, and we're talking millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of uh, you know, commissioning dollars, 1.5% were going to African-American composers and musicians. So where we see ourselves now is trying to fill that gap and fill that need of really building a 21st century canon where the Apollo is looking to put African-American voices and artists at the center and in order to be a home for those voices. So we're looking at artists that we know will be definers for the 21st century. ta Coates is one of our, um, our first artists in residence. Um, we have been working close, very closely with um, um, the choreographer, Camille Brown, about building new work. Um, um, we are, have been working um, with a collective, um, Eb Ebony Noel Golden, who built a great deal of sort of interactive building work with the Feminist Women Collective, um, interactive and site-specific work um, that we've also commissioned. So we, we basically, you know, so for us, we're looking at ourselves not just as a music hall and as a presenter, but as a commissioner and a developer of new works, um, as well as a presenter. So with that being said, so we, responding to the need of what we saw in the landscape um, was, was a big part of our strategy there. Yeah, sorry, I got to take notes because okay. I'm going to send to class. But, you know, a commissioner of arts. I mean, there's so much to unpack there on the business side. But I, I do appreciate the vision as a leadership to all my students who are listening to it. I, this is what we talk about. But Carl, I don't know if you want to kind of add on to that last if, if, if other people want to jump in, I don't want to, you know, uh, and then I can jump back in too. Are there questions? Do we want to let room for yeah, some? Well, I think I, we're going to have, uh, maybe we go like one last toss to you. Okay, I have great. to come in and then that'll give us like 20 minutes at the end where we great. can open it up. But, but again, if anybody, again, if you have a question, put it in the chat and I, and I, and I'm certainly, if I speak for Carl, if you want to jump in and add on, yeah, uh, yeah. Don't, cool. don't wait for us at the same time. Well, go ahead, Carl, with, with uh, your thought. 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I guess I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, the the kind of TV uh, um, uh, theater, TV film theater uh, b b boundary crossing, you know, because one, one of the things I've seen, uh, uh, and you talk about, you know, how theater is going to be more responsive in, in this uh, in this time period, uh, almost all of the playwrights I know are now uh, writing for TV. Uh, and, you know, so they're still writing some plays sometimes, but we've lost a lot of theater writers uh, because they actually make money uh, when they write uh, for TV um, uh, and film. And I wonder about, uh, you know, in terms of like your own career because you bounce back and forth uh, and as a director, um, and then kind of, you know, I, I wonder about like where the, uh, the world of like new works lives, especially around theater, given, you know, this kind of migration uh, to another art, uh, to another art, uh, genre, you know? So I, I, you know, as you're traversing that yourself. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited about the, the, the genre crossing. I'm, I mean, I, um, I, it's funny, we were just having this conversation, um, the Apollo, with some of our, our, our agent representations about some of the work that we're commissioning. And what we're looking at is an opportunity to help to develop not just work for or commission and develop work, not just for the live stage, but also theater. That was something that was never really heard of. Um, I'm sorry, also television. Yeah. That was something that really was not really even heard of four years ago. We wouldn't want to put that in a contract because we couldn't really see what the trajectory of that could be. But when we look at our artist, um, when we look at not only and 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 not and I'm not just referring to sort of theater on television, um, but you know I think even with between the world and me being one of the examples as another opportunity for this work to be um, imagined for the stage, but then reimagined also then for film, um, but yet and still and west to your to your business sense, um, the Apollo still owns a development IP. Uh, of um, of that iteration, of several of those iterations. So we're able to uh, ride the journey, if you will, as an institution of, of each sort of manifestation of the work. Um, and quite frankly, I think that's the future. Um, I, I think that we've got to be thinking about storytelling in many different mediums um, because culture is moving so rapidly. And I think if we don't, it's gonna happen anyway. So as institutions, we just have to figure out how to catch up. Um, you know, as producers, we have to figure out how to make sure that we're holding space for, for all of these conversations and manifestations of work to happen. Um, yeah, and, and it's, a, it's, it's really a catch up game because, because quite frankly, the creators, a culture, like you, you mentioned, Pete Carl, the writers, they're, 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 they're way ahead of us in that, in that respect. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm thinking a little bit about like, uh, you know, training programs because I, you know, I, I, I teach, I teach across uh, disciplines, but I also teach in performing arts and, and, you know, I, I wonder, I mean, even in my own career, like I, I, I'm crossing genres all the time. It's the only way to survive as an artist with your own work, right? I mean, you can't just say I'm like now that the theater shut down, I can't wait for the play to, I mean, you know, like if somebody wants to do TV, um, well, let's do TV, right? And so, um, and I, I, I think about just even in like the training universe, uh, this idea of, you know, how to be training, like our, our theater programs, you know, is it, you know, like we've always had TV and film and theater over here. And, I, you know, so I just even wonder about the, the disciplines because when, you know, you talk about Apollo and I mean, that's a big deal to jump into the IP of TV and film at the, I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't know if everybody on the call could like, that's a huge thing that I'd love to just chat for several hours with you about, you know, <laughs> because of the, but, but it's huge, you know, that's a huge piece of, I mean, it's been an argument for, uh, uh, you know, where the IP lives and who, how do people benefit and how are these institutions going to go on? And so um, it's a really radical idea um, about the future of the form. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, and, and I think, you know, I think you said it, P. Carl, you know, the artists are already doing it. Um, the artists are already traversing forums and there's no boundaries. So, you know, it's, it's us who have to really sort of begin to really catch up. Um, you know, and I think this, I also think that this time period has really taught us something, right, in theater and live performance and live touring and music. Like, you know, artists, music artists, they make their money touring. March 15th, I remember the day, things shut down for us at the Apollo. I mean, we, we saw our, our balance sheet lose 
$5 million in like a matter of hours um, before our the fiscal year end, like just cancellation, 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 cancellation. I mean, it was, it was like, what? So we had to, you know, as every performing arts institution, touring, Live Nation, everyone had to, had to scramble to figure out, well, how are we going to survive? Um, how are we going to survive? How are we going to do things differently? Um, and it was a really quick, fast, and a hurry pivot. Um, and, you know, I think about it now, and it's like, yeah, these were things that we were talking about in the back of our minds, like, yeah, we're going to get to our digital strategy. Yeah, that's the future, blah, 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 blah. Um, but, but this really was a, a swift kick in the butt, like, where we needed to get our act together quickly. Um, so and do things differently and and that's what i think was the biggest lesson and i and i and i think for me it's always like well how can we how can we be more on the forefront of that doing things differently and as arts institutions and culture institutions almost think like tech companies right yeah. they always want to be on the cusp right they're never stay, staying where they are so they're five steps ahead of us and if we're supposed to be leaders of culture why are we five steps ahead like i'm always asking my staff like guys what what are we talking y'all on beta like we're we're digital what are y'all doing we gotta let's move you know but um but it's a different kind of training it's a different kind of thinking. I do think it starts with the training, P. Carl, and the training institution and where that integration. I think um, I remember um, Carnegie Mellon had a really interesting program where theater and the arts and gaming program was inextricably linked. I mean, I think when we think about that, it, it I, I, I think that's where it should start. Um, I think, and, and it doesn't end there, right? And, and, and so it follows us even outside of, um, outside of the training institutions and, and, and um, you know, education institutions. As well, yeah, yeah. That's I. I just oh, I don't. My students, that, that last bit about like how we need to think like tech is what I've been screaming in like my classes for years. Of it's so like there is such a model to do it. I, I I'm so happy you said that because now I know I'm not completely crazy if if I have some backup. But anyway, but now it's perfect. Like six forty, Kristen has a couple of questions from students um that she wants to lay on you Kristen if you want to go there and then again you guys can keep sending them privately to me or to her or you can put them out there and I just do want to shout out that we have a um IP lawyer in the house who eyes lit up when you start talking about IP uh Bamathy, who's, who's one of our professors um but I'm and sure a fan of and a fan of yours although Wes kind of winces when I say that because I start standing and he gets embarrassed by that <laughs> I've always been a huge fan of yours Camilla but I do think that point about you know about owning the IP that Carl was talking about is like it's not just because it helps you move forward it's also it's empowering and this is what I keep telling my class is that especially for artists of color this is the line that I just hammer all the time and this is what I care about the most in the world right it's the only way you can empower yourself is by owning your IP. Yes, yes. That's, That's it. We have seen the history of exploitation of African-American arts and cultures. Sorry, Wes, I'm getting on my bandwagon again and we, <laughs> but you know, but it's true. Um, you know, it's, it's a history of exploitation based in IP exploitation. And the big questions that um, people um, like Latif Matima and Kevin Green and all these, you know, Latif is at Howard and Kevin's at USC. These uh, fellow um, um, academics of mine are talking about is sort of how do we change that story up, right? And you're on the forefront of that. You are really making that happen. And, you know, it's not a coincidence that it's happening in the hip hop world too, right? The, the most savvy artists as Wes knows well, and I'm sure you know as well, are the ones who really are getting ahead of this. That's I, right. What do you think? I mean, I think that's just, it's just critical. So absolutely. I mean, I think I think again, it's the empowerment of owning of owning your product, of owning your creation. Um, because then if you don't, it will continue to mutate into other things that you actually don't even have control over. Um, you know, and and it, and it's so revolutionary when we think about even when we talk about publishing. And I know publishing is a very also different world as well, but we um we're working with with our a documentary. We had an original song built by Robert Glasper. And I remember we were trying to license the rights to use it for something else. And when we found out that Glasper, he was like, yeah, no, I own the publishing of this. I was like, wow, that's amazing. That's great. 
right? So now he has control over his work, over the destiny of the work. I then can't take it and, and do whatever I will, I, what, whatever I want to with it, right? So he always then sticks with it all the way through. So, I, I mean, I just think it's just an empowering thing. And, 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 you know, the big challenge now is really thinking, thinking about ownership beyond what we can even imagine. That's the big thing. Because technology is now dictating a world that we have yet to imagine that we have to figure out language and a way to say, how do I remain involved, even when this thing mutates into beyond gaming, beyond, I don't know, AI, beyond, beyond, beyond. Um, and, and, and that, I think, is a big challenge, I'm sure, for, for IP lawyers moving ahead. Mela, how do you do that? Like, how, I mean, I totally agree, but at the same time, like, how do you, I remember doing, like, recording contracts they started changing, it was like, you know, the rights to cassette, CD, vinyl, and any other mode of communication known throughout the universe. Like, but from a practical standpoint, and you as a leader, and I'm sorry, Chris, I know you have those questions to jump in here, but how do you even, how do you do that, right? How do you think beyond the tangible? Mm. Like, with, like, almost like it's impossible, but you kind of got to do it, like, how do you, position your mind to do such a thing yeah that makes sense yeah no it does and you know i i don't even know if i have language but i'll tell you is that like having smart people who don't work in your sector around you mm -hmm. um we started um some really interesting conversations with um partners at apple um and you know and and I, I, what really was very mind blowing about a lot of what these technologists were working and working on um, and what they were looking to share with us. Um, and it's a, a sort of small think tank. I knew we weren't ready as an institution to even really implement that work because I didn't even fully understand it yet. But just being in the conversation to know what is actually coming down the pike is critical. Um, and, and, and I think 10 years ago, this idea of, you know, um, a performing arts institution with a tech company would have, would have seemed absurd. Um, but quite frankly, those are the kinds of partnerships that are, will only um, keep you on the forefront, right? Um, Beats by Dre, smartest thing ever, right? That collaboration with Apple Music, I remember when that dropped five years ago, I was like, aha, there is forefront, I get it. Right, because of you know the catalog of Apple Music and the potential of Apple Music, the branding power of Dr. Dre. Like I got it, but also an opportunity for music and culture to stay on the forefront of technology. That is brilliant, um, and and so I so I, I I'll say that right. Like we're not technologists. We we're, we're that's not what I do personally, nor many people on my staff. But I think through strategic partnerships, we could be thinking that way, um, and then ultimately, hopefully form language that can help and be all encompassing. So we'll ultimately know and won't be behind the eight ball. And also listen to the youths. Yes, <laughs> Antoine. <laughs> of our professors. Yes, you know, listen to the York youth. Professor, the youth them. Um, so, um, so yeah, so uh, Kristen, if you wanna go and ask some of those questions, we can open it up to get some other folks because yeah, we could all dominate, but we, don't yeah. Work. Um. So before I ask one of the questions that got sent in, I just want to let everyone know on here, if you have one, you can just send it in the chat and we'll like go in the order that they've come in. Um, we'll call on you to read yours out. But um, Camilla, one of the questions that came in uh, was from a student who couldn't make it, Corey. And he asks, so what, what was your career path that led you to running the Apollo? And then what did you learn in those different jobs that helped you uh, with, with running the Apollo and then also what did you wish you learned that you like looking back on it you were like oh if I was doing this earlier it would have been nice yeah so career paths running the Apollo so, okay so I told you guys about the hip-hop theater festival that was my you know the collective that we founded um right out of college and um and then and then continued on. It's actually still a full running nonprofit organization that I founded with actually who I mentioned, Clyde Valentine, um, who are our mutual friends here. Um, <clears throat> but you know, amongst that, I was also had a billion side jobs because I was not only running that organization, I was also a director trying to make my way. So because of that, I was also a bartender. I, I worked at a gym. Like I had a billion jobs um, just to make the rent. Um, 
but you know what that, um, the, and, and so that, that was sort of that period. The Hip Hop Theater Festival led me to, um, I was working with a lot of spoken word poets. Sarah Jones was an artist that we produced um, as a part of our Hip Hop Theater Festival the first year. Um, we worked with poets like Lemon Anderson. We worked with Stacey Ann Chin. Um, and then at that point, um, a director named Stan Lathan was just beginning to create a uh, deaf Poetry Jam, what what ultimately became Deaf Poetry Jam. And I met with him and he was looking for um, a kind of a talent producer. Um, I knew all the folks in the world. So I started working on that show as a talent producer, then became the creative producer on that series and co-EP on that series. Um, it ran for seven seasons on HBO um, and then went on to produce some other spinoffs in uh, with Stan. Um, another series called Brave New Voices, which was about youth poets um, all around the country, college youth poets, I, several of which I think actually, two of which actually went to Emerson um, years ago though, um, but that was amazing. Um, and, and, and started producing other content for uh, PBS, um, et cetera. Parallel to that was still directing, um, um, directing with my friends like Katori Hall, um, like Dominique Morceau for the theater, um, also started doing commercial directing for Broadway um, in which I was um, uh, worked a bunch with Kenny Leon on, on The Mountaintop, which is a work actually I developed with Katori early on um, and then got to work with Kenny when it went to Broadway um, and then did Raisin in the Sun. I did The Wiz Live on NBC. So I, I was really sort of directing and producing in sort of this parallel path mode. Um, and all of those worlds, um, and amongst that, there was a point I was also um, curator in residence at the Kennedy Center for about 10 years, um, in which I did a lot of their hip hop programming um, and um, for a, a good deal of time. So all of that kind of work, I think, led me to the Apollo was this idea of creative producing and this idea of artistic directing, this idea of also nurturing new voices and working with new artists. Um, and new work, um, and also working in television. Um, and the Apollo has sort of a long track record um, in the world of media as well. So uh, the, all of that kind of, those all roads led to sort of the Apollo. Um, and it was a job I actually wasn't looking for because I liked my gypsy life. I liked, like I said early on, I always had a hundred jobs. I liked that freedom. Um, I didn't know what it meant to just land one place. Um, but at the Apollo, I felt like I could do all of that. And, it, and, and sort of all of my octopus wings uh, could actually, tentacles could like take hold in one institution. And that's what made it attractive. That's awesome. That's such a great story. Um, Another question that got sent in, because you talked um, about how you were directing throughout the whole thing. So Leigh has a pretty general question on producing and directing. It's very hands-on work. Um, do you think education is important in other worlds? Like where, what is more important they wanna know? Is it experience or education? And do you personally think it's worth it to go get a master's degree now? Mm. <laughs> oh, right, okay. So, um, right, do I think it's worth it? I think it depends. Um, I mean, I think it, it it all depends, right? Like, I, I feel like, you know, I, I I was, I got a BFA at Howard. So what was really great about my training was um, around working with act, what I felt was really helpful now is as a director working with actors, right? Like that was a really great foundational training. Um, and, you know, uh, there were some of my friends and colleagues that went on to get a master's in acting after that. And there were others who were, you know, that maybe wasn't as necessary. That sort of other level of training maybe might not have been as necessary. And I, yeah, so what do I think? What is my opinion? I mean, I, I'm always of the school is that, you know, you, you live and you learn, um, quite frankly. Um, I, I think that a training and foundation is important because it's important to know the rules so that you can break them and recreate your own. Um, that I think is critical. Um, it's important to know the language so that you, you know, can, you know, redefine that and um, reframe it in your own lens. Um, that I think is important. I, I don't always think that, you know, it's necessary for higher education, for a master's degree um, for everybody. Um, yeah, I know that's a real wishy-washy language because I know I'm talking to students at Emerson, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't, don't hold back. Let them, let them know. We're okay. I, just, I, just think that, I think that some of the most of the most like, you know, uh, the biggest lessons that I've learned have been on the job, right? I have been working, have been watching as a director. 
um, you know, have been watching other directors. Now, what I will say as a director and a producer, generally when you're in that role, um, if you're not apprenticing or having one of those opportunities, there will be very limited opportunities that you get to watch others who are great at it work. So the beauty I think of educational institutions is that it becomes that safety net for you to work all of that out and take those risks and really learn the language and, and, and make mistakes and make really great successes that you can take with you. Because a lot of opportunities, particularly in those roles, it's, it's, there's very limited opportunities that you can sit and observe and learn in that way. I, this is Claudine, sorry. I, I, wanna, I wanna echo what you're saying because I think, um, and, and I question myself, <laughs> I question this about myself a lot and I've been working in the industry that I work in for over 20 years. Like, would it be better for me to have had a master's degree? And I always go back to, mm, nah, I'm good. Because I, I was able to have the opportunity to, I fell into this in the industry and I'm, I'm in marketing, event production, experiential marketing. But I had the opportunity to learn this industry that I never knew anything about. And the path that I took learned different aspects of it, which I was grateful for. So I did new business, I did client services, I did production and everything from actual branding and marketing. So things that you would learn if you had gone to get an MBA, I actually, within the, the time that I worked, got that experience. But that is not something that is the norm. If you, I think if you have a, a, a path that you know that you want to take and you want the support of those degrees, absolutely. But if it's, if it's not a direct path that you know that and you're just kind of figuring things out, it might not always be the best thing other than the experience that you would get in the real world. I, I agree. Shout out Claudine goes all the <laughs> way back from the beginning. For those who don't know Claudine, Claudine and I went to undergrad way back in Virginia days. Thank you for adding on and good to see you. You're nice. Oh, my silhouette for now. Y'all don't need to see me right now, but my silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. Silhouette still looks at you. <laughs> so, uh, so that's great to know as Carl and I, and I see our department chair are working on the graduate program. I guess we should just stop because if Camilla and Claudine, <laughs> did they say, you know, no. <laughs> yeah. thanks, thanks for no, nothing, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm messing with you. I'm, I'm with totally you. willing to get off the committee. It's fine. <laughs> I was, listen, I was lucky. I will tell you that right now. And I even, even those that I work with and those that come in under me, I tell them wherever, where, you know, wherever you are, learn from, learn from it, take from it whether you get laid off, whether you get fired, whether you're moving on to something else, do not leave this place without learning something and taking something. Um, whatever it is, knowledge, experience, you, you have to do that in any, any role that you're in. And so whomever I'm working with, I, I make sure that I do teach them something. I do help them to elevate from where they are so that they can you know, be better than me at the end of the day. But it does have to do, and it's not always going to happen. Like there are things that you're you're picking up and that you'll know that you're not even realizing it. Because my first boss out of college, he was not the best manager, and he said it from the jump. He's not, but but he didn't even know that he was teaching me so much, and I still connect with him to today. To today, and I learned, I learned majority of what I know from him, and he probably would say, I don't know what the hell I taught you, but he taught me so much. But you have to you have to observe, you have to listen, you have to take initiative, like those things you have to do or else it's just gonna go over your head. Yeah, kind of going um, off of that, the last question, we have time for one more, got sent in um, by Brent. It's about mentoring. So if you were to mentor your 20 year old self, what advice would you give? And uh, what also, um, a little off topic is, what change maker has your attention right now? If you wanna throw a name out there of someone for students to look at. Mm. Okay, um, if I, okay, so I'm gonna do that. Okay, ooh, okay. Um, I'm thinking about mentoring my 20, advice that I would give my 20 year old self. Yeah, if you were, if you were mentoring your 20 year old self, what would you tell yourself? Yeah. Which is like the age of most students right now. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I, I feel like, you know, what I would tell myself is 
walk very slowly through your mistakes. I, um, I, I, I tended to, um, when I would make a mistake, get very down on myself and then want to run very quickly and be like, oh my God, I fucked up. Oh, this is so horrible. Oh my God. Versus like really understanding and learning and analyzing what is a lesson? What is a lesson to be learned? Um, because then what I found is that I continue to make those mistakes over and over and over again to my 20s and to my 30s. Um, so I, I think it is about really being uncomfortable in those being comfortable in those very uncomfortable spaces and particularly embracing and walking slowly through my mistakes. That's that's what I would tell my 20 year old self. Um, change makers who I'm inspired by right now. Um, hmm. You know what, I'm, I'm really inspired by, um, there's some musicians, I, there's two people that are coming to mind. Um, one is uh, Adrian Marie Brown um, and another is Kamasi Washington as an artist, um, but as a change maker also. Um, the, the brilliance of Kamasi, and we worked with him at the Apollo a couple times, and I want to do more work with him, but um, he, and, and what I love about him is that he does not define his work. Um, and as much as people want to pin him in holes of you are a jazz musician, you're jazz, you're this, you're that, you're R&B, what are you, soul? He remains, um, and he himself really pushes against those labels, which I think has given him so much freedom as just an artist to build, to create. So this idea of boundaries, he has built a world that is very boundaryless. So when we presented him, for instance, to the Apollo, super excited. It's like, oh my gosh, this is Kamasi. And you know, what do you want to do? Big vision. And he was like, okay, right. So I just made this film, and I was like. Okay, great. You know, and and I want to put you know thirty musicians on stage, and and what was a beautiful about that is that you know we're used to these sort of very cut and dry sort of touring writers, etc. But you know he had such a more expansive thinking, and um and that was just so inspiring. And so you know we had to respond like, okay, we're going to figure out how to screen this film. We're going to figure out you know where we wouldn't have this other conversation with other musicians. But he allowed himself to be boundaryless. Um, and and I think even similar with Adrian um, Marie Brown. She's an activist. She has a book um, that I just absolutely loved called Emergent Strategy, which really talks about organizing. Um, and um, it's a book for organizers, but also this idea of organizers and activists during this time. Like, how do we also organize and activate and 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 do our work? from a place of love and compassion. Um, and, and, and many times we don't see sort of those two worlds being very sort of diametrically opposed um, and self-love and self-compassion um, in order to infuse that into the work. Um, so anyway, th those are two people who I think are really inspiring me right now. Uh, I'm just gonna jump in with a kind of a last question and then we will we'll we'll let you uh, go to the other worlds that you live in. Um, the um, you know, I guess I just one thing you 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 give. Oh, I think he froze. Oh no, Carl froze. <laughs> he, they cut off his internet because he's moving. That's what they did. Um, okay, so might won't we? Uh, oh, there he is. Oh, there. You oh, am I back? All right. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I, I just was saying I would I would be happy just to take the first half walk slowly. Um, uh, and then, you know, through my mistakes uh, too, but, uh, <laughs> you know, like I need both those, um, the, just a wrap up question is, you know, we're in this pandemic. It's a discouraging time to be an entrepreneur, to be an artist, to be any of those things. You're, you know, you saw $5 million go in five seconds. Uh, what, 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 just what, what, uh, what are your, what are your words of hope to the, the students out here, uh, in this moment? is that you know even amongst um our our challenges there were there were opportunities um case in point between the world and me we weren't thinking of it as a film we were thinking of touring it live as a theatrical property because of the pandemic because of also the need to speak out around the blm blm protests and movements made way for this film 
What it also made way for, for us as a black institution to have conversations with the network to also talk about leverage. Um, and, and part of that leverage and part of that deal also came, although we saw 5 million go out the door, we negotiated a $1 million gift from HBO directly to uh, the Apollo, which would have been way above and beyond what we would have received for licensing fees for this film. But the leverage was really also about, listen, we understand the value of this content for audiences at this moment. So, you know, uh, unfortunately, yes, it's in a pandemic. Yes, we are in the midst of, you know, several pandemics. Um, but even amongst that, always find way. And, and there is always lining <laughs> where there is a glimmer of hope, not just hope, but opportunity. And where do we find the opportunity amongst, amongst these moments of challenge? Um, and, 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 and that's just, so, just an anecdote, I think, from, um, from the Apollo side of thing and from Beats uh, Between the World and Me, which I hope everyone can watch November 21st, HBO, 8 p.m. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth, I was about to say plug, you gotta plug the product. Say it one more time for, for those in the back. Sure, November 21st. Um, oh, and look at our producer. This is our lead producer, Elisa Payne, yeah. who just jumped in. Oh, is Elisa here? Oh. Uh, yeah. Hi, Wes. Hi, everybody. It's so good to see all these young theater people, students. Yes. I, Camila, listen, Camila changed the game, as they say, when it comes to making this deal with HBO. Not only did she make the deal for the Apollo Theater, she also made it for... Um, Howard University, her alma mater, and made sure that all the people who worked behind the scenes were people who looked like us. So they were a lot of women and people of color. And so Camila is definitely, this is this is a, a master class. If you haven't written your notes, get the recording because she is wonderful. But yes, as been said, um, yes, watch HBO. No, uh, November 21st is what, four days away, Saturday. And we are so proud of it. And you can say that you've met this genius and had this time to commune and to learn from her. Thank you so much for allowing me to be I didn't pay here. her to say that. <laughs> no, no, she did not pay me to see. Thank you for um, letting me be here. And I, I have to jump off of something else, but thank you, Wes, you're doing a great job. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I don't know, Camille, you know, like, I, look, Elisa and then shout out Miguel's also here. Like our kids, are like good friends and that's how we all connect so it's so crazy how the how, to the students how small the world is um the person that's sitting in that classroom next to you and then to think about that carl knows clyde and i'm sure probably keep digging miguel knows clyde like we probably all may have been in the same room so i almost think about that student sitting next to you is going to be the producer the professor the director in a couple of years. So, you know, I guess savor this time. Uh, but it is, I mean, this is kind of, I'm tripping out to see every, all of, and then Claudine, who's been doing dirt with for like 20 years uh, in another world. But Camilla. And I, you know, and I know Mark Bamuti Joseph from, um, <laughs> from high school. <laughs> we used to ride the train together, and his cousin was in my brother's, it's a whole thing. <laughs> But, uh, but Mila, I don't. We I know it's a busy time, and, it, and we're super excited that you. Right, I'm glad the timing right before the the, the movie debuts. But I want to thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you want to say some parting words before I say my thank yous and goodbyes. No, it's just a pleasure to talk to you guys. It was a really thank you for having me on, in Wes and Carl. This is really amazing. Um, thank you for inviting me, um, and it's great to meet all the professors here and students here, and just talking with you guys. Yeah, um, I want to talk about the nature of that deal for like two hours. So what we'll have to—I don't know—we got to figure out. I see Bob. We can talk. I know. I'll talk, and then I need—I need to bring you and everybody in to teach, like, like guest. Uh, what is it? Uh, what well, our chair is here, like visiting professorships. I see down the line um, with the grad program that y'all trash, but that's okay. I'm still going to give y'all. <laughs> No, I messed with you. I need to sign up for a class. I'm not trying to trash it. I'm just trying to keep talking about it. But I just want to say, I want to say thank you so much. Thanks to Carl and Joanna and Stacy, who really um, getting this concept together of, of kind of bringing you in was really spearheaded by them. Again, thank you for all the faculty. Thank you for all the uh, Bamathy bringing her class through. Shout out to, to you all and to all the people who are not Emerson who saw it on Instagram or got the link. My dad is here, who now crashes all of our Zoom meetings that Kristen knows. So shout out Hudson Jackson. But this is really great information and I, and I really appreciate it. And then uh, this is our last event of the 
semester. Everybody stay safe. It's about to get hectic again. Uh, we want to see you all back here uh, in one piece and keep your family safe. And again, best of luck to you, Camilla. I'll be tuning in. All right? Yeah. All right. We love you. Thank y'all. Y'all be good. Thank you. All right. Peace, peace.